<laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Richmond Wong. Um, and also, thanks to Anessa and the iSchool staff and student affairs team for organizing this whole event. Um, tonight, I'm going to discuss a design research project I've been working on in collaboration with several other Berkeley researchers, uh, James Pierce at the Jacobs Institute of Design, Ellen Van Wyk, a former MIMS student here, um, and iSchool faculty, John Chuang, and Deirdre Mulligan, who's my advisor. In our work, we created a set of provocative and speculative design fictions in order to explore privacy issues around biosensing technologies, or broadly, technologies that sense human bodies. And so I'll talk a bit about our designs, talk about how we shared these designs with some different audiences, and then I'll step back and have some initial reflections about what we've learned about privacy and design through this process. Um, so for some motivation, back in 2007, the US Department of Homeland Security proposed a program to try to predict criminal behavior in advance of the crime itself, using things like thermal sensing, computer vision, eye tracking, gait sensing, and all, all the other physiological signals. And supposedly, it would, quote, avoid all privacy issues. <laughs> right? And it's pretty clear that privacy was not necessarily fully thought through in this project. And while that imagined future hasn't exactly come to fruition, a lot of those types of sensors are now becoming available as consumer devices. And it still often seems that privacy isn't adequately thought through before new sensing devices and services are publicly announced or released. Um, there does exist a range of privacy approaches, such as design patterns, engineering patterns, privacy assessments, but many of these existing privacy mitigation tools are either deductive or they assume that privacy problems, concerns, or harms are already well-known and well-defined in advance of making a system. Um, so these can be really useful tools and processes, but we often don't have privacy concerns well conceptualized in advance before making a system. And we often resort to saying amorphous things like, well, people have different conceptions of privacy, and we just kind of leave it at that. Um, instead, I suggest that design approaches can help us better explore, define, and perhaps even anticipate the kind of problem space of privacy, helping us articulate specific conceptions of what we mean by privacy when we're thinking about emerging technologies. So sort of concurrently to this, we see that popular works of science fiction often imagine social changes and effects related to technology in very situational and nuanced ways. And so our starting hunch and motivation for doing this work was that we could leverage um, design to help us think through privacy-related values at stake in biosensing technologies. And that by designing for provocation and reflection, it might allow us to do a similar type of work using design that science fiction often does culturally. And we turn to a practice from design research called design fiction. And so the orientation of design fiction is to use design to raise questions rather than using design to find a specific solution to a problem. Um, design fiction uses diegetic prototypes to open up a space for discussion. So in other words, the artifacts created through design fiction help create a narrative world or fictional reality in which they exist. And by creating these yet to be realized design concepts, design fiction tries to create a space to think about possible alternative worlds and alternative futures. These designs don't need to be practical or implementable. Um, rather, they're used as probes, like as Nick talked about in the, his presentation. Um, probes to help us question our own assumptions about how the world works and help us expand our imaginations about what we might think is possible for good, for bad, and kind of everything in between. And one of the new things that we did in our work was use a science fiction novel as a starting point to create our design fictions. So in part, we were inspired by Donna Haraway's description that myth and tool mutually constitute each other, the myth being kind of the science fiction and the tool being the design work we're doing. Practically, we could also tap into an author's already existing richly imagined world rather than having to create our own imagined world from scratch. And moreover, we thought that designing a set of design fictions inspired by sci-fi would help provide insight into how fiction helps shape broader cultural narratives and imaginaries about technology. So obviously, there's a lot of science fiction out there in the world. Um, we gravitated towards Dave Eggers' 2013 novel, The Circle, for a few reasons. And a movie version was released earlier this year, but our work is based on the novel, because we did it before the movie came out. <laughs> um, as a mass market book, it presents an opportunity to look at a contemporary and popular depiction of biosensing technologies, as opposed to the mid-20th century stories like 1984 or Minority Report, which are often referred to when people think about fiction and privacy. And so this book reflects some timely concerns about privacy and increasing data collection. 
Uh, briefly, the novel is set in a near future. It focuses on a powerful technology company called The Circle. And in the book, this company keeps introducing new sensing technologies that supposedly provide greater user value, but to the reader, they seem increasingly invasive of privacy. And the novel utilizes kind of a dark humor to portray this, um, satirizing the techno-optimism rhetoric of many of today's technology companies. Cool. So design fictions come in many forms. Ours take the form of imagined products and kind of imagined interfaces and web pages, which also lets us exaggerate and play into kind of existing rhetorics around uh, technologies. Uh, we selected several technologies from the novel and some real life prototypes to inspire our designs. And then we began to iterate beyond those initial points of inspiration with our own ideas. Um, you can see more of our designs at the link below. But for us, a natural starting point was that it's a novel, and the novel doesn't have any illustrations. So we started designing based on what the book's kind of uh, word descriptions were of the different technologies. So for instance, this is Child Track. And this is a technology from the novel. It's a small chip that's implanted into the bone of a child's body, which allows parents to monitor their child's location at all times. Um, and later in the story, it's also suggested that these chips can store a child's educational records, their homework attendance, and test scores, because parents want to access all of their child's information in one place. You know, isn't that great and wonderful? Um, and so this interface shows what we imagine a parent might see. And in this situation, it's the child that doesn't have any privacy, supposedly for their own safety and for kind of improving broader educational metrics. And so we took this idea of the tracking implant, and we began imagining kind of other worlds beyond the novel, um, ones with different social norms, ones with different legal regimes, or people in different subject positions, and how these technologies might play out in those other imagined worlds, and how it might lead to other types of privacy concerns. So one way we reimagined this idea was to use the tracking implant to think through issues of workplace privacy. Um, so this scenario advertises a workplace tracking implant. Employers make their employees implant these devices to keep track of the workers' whereabouts and work activities to kind of improve corporate efficiency. Um, and while it's presented in this kind of very positive, you know, happy way, the lack of employee viewpoints in this whole thing um, raises questions for us about kind of power and labor, um, how employees might also try to resist or game these systems too. Then another example is that the circle never discusses third parties like advertisers. So we imagined a service that's built on top of the child track implant that's aimed at advertisers to leverage all the data collected about a child to target them with great you know, advertisements personalized just for them. Um, and this kind of represents a legal fiction because it would be pretty unlikely for this to happen under current e EU and US uh, child data protection laws. But for us, this collection of designs helped us um, helped highlight how privacy is not a binary or absolute quality. Rather, in line with recent conceptions of privacy, it's situated, it's contextual, and it's dependent on one's subject position. Each design posits a different imagined world in which kind of different groups or different things get to have privacy or, on the other hand, benefit from not having privacy. Um, privacy gets violated in different ways and by different actors, and the designs also suggest that there are different sets of social norms or laws that influence the use, adoption, and appropriation of these technologies. So after going through this process of creating these design fictions and reflecting on them ourselves as design researchers, we wanted to understand how others might use these designs to discuss and reflect on privacy. So we shared them with uh, professional degree graduate students training to go into tech industry jobs. And we found that they interacted with the designs in a few ways that allowed them to surface discussion and reflections about privacy. And I'll talk about just a couple of those tonight. So one thing that happened was that participants had a variety of effective and often kind of reflexive responses to the designs. So this design here is a kind of security system which automatically classifies people into suspicious and non-suspicious categories. Um, so one participant who we showed this to reflected on his own role as a data scientist saying, the creepy thing, the bad thing is, and I'm a data scientist, so it's probably bad for me too, but the data science is predicting, like minority report, predicting the tendency of this person to be a criminal. That would probably be bad because you don't know if this person will be a criminal. Basically, you don't hire data scientists. Then he kind of laughs at his own statement. Um, but here he began to reflect on how his own practices might be implicated in this product's creepiness, that his propensity to use data to predict if subjects might be criminals or not might not be a great thing. 
And then after this, he also went on to compare alternative ways one might design the system um, in ways that are less creepy. And for other designs, participants often had visceral reactions to the designs, calling them creepy or uncomfortable. Um, sometimes participants also laughed or provided really sarcastic remarks back, similar to how the designs are kind of exaggerating um, and parodying current trends. But these kind of emotional and effective responses provided useful opportunities to reflect on why certain aspects of these designs were creepy or privacy invasive and allowed for us to kind of think about alternative ways to make these too. And so even though participants were aware that the designs were imagined, they often interacted with the designs in, the way, in ways that expanded the imagined world. So some participants imagined the designs kind of almost as they were real by thinking about long-term effects. Um, so this design here is a easily hideable, wearable, live streaming HD camera. And one participant imagined how social norms might change if these cameras were kind of widespread in the future. Um, he says that the definition of wrongdoing would be questioned, would be scrutinized. So he suggests that previously unmonitored activities would become open for surveillance and tracking. And others try to do things by telling stories about users in these worlds, or they try to imagine how they themselves or their families and loved ones would fit into the worlds in which these technologies exist. And so participants became actively involved in fleshing out and creating the worlds in which the designs exist, kind of crossing boundaries between thinking of these design worlds as fictional or real. And so after doing this design work, um, I reflected on how design fiction was useful for us, particularly in this way that it blurs kind of what's real and what's fictional and how it could be useful for thinking about privacy. And after viewing all those different images, um, you might be not quite sure about what about them was real and what about them was fictional. And that boundary and tension is something that we try to intentionally explore through the designs. And even after creating the designs, we were actually really surprised to find out how some of these products that we thought were fictional were really close to being realized as real. Um, there was news about Swedish and I think Minnesotan workers implanting themselves with RFID chips about six months after we made this work. Um, and so some of these designs the technologies are more imagined, while in other designs, it's the technologies basically exist today, but the social practices and norms around them are more imaginary. But we find it really useful to blur these boundaries of real and fictional to recognize how the real and the fictional are inherently co-constructed. Uh, when viewing the designs, participants help blur these boundaries, kind of imagining what if these designs were real. And they also drew connections from our designs to other technologies, both real ones and technologies and other fictional media. And this lets us draw a myriad of connections that might let us see these technologies and designs in a new light. So if that camera design, we can connect the advanced camera in the circle to established products like GoPro cameras, to more experimental ideas like Google Glass, um, to other cameras and other fiction like in Black Mirror, and link to current socio-political debates like the role of cameras and policing. But tracing these relationships helps us see how imaginaries of technology, of privacy, and of surveillance are mutually constituted among practices that are involved in research, in corporate product development, and in works of fiction, and gives insight to how this constitution is kind of an ongoing process. Yeah. And given our interest in the privacy implications of these technologies, we looked to privacy research before starting our design work, understanding privacy as contextual, situated, and dependent on one subject position. Uh, so Mulligan et al. suggests that rather than trying to come up with a single universal definition of privacy, it's more productive to map how various conceptions of privacy are represented in particular situations along these kind of five meta dimensions. And after each round of our designs, we analyzed the designs and we mapped our participants' discussions of privacy using this framework. And this allows us to articulate and map how we were exploring different conceptions of privacy using specific language without going to that amorphous, people have different conceptions. So we use the process of making these designs as well as the process of sharing the designs to articulate different conceptions of privacy, what context, what things and people are being protected by privacy, what groups threaten privacy, and it surfaces how different possible solutions to protect privacy might be different in each of these cases. In some, it might be better addressed through a technical measure, in some by a law or a rule, or maybe specialized training for the operators of technology. And this is really interesting because this design process gives us a broader lens to view privacy, highlighting a wide range of privacy conceptions as well as a range of mechanisms to address privacy 
that include, but also go beyond just technical design solutions. So kind of in summary, um, this process of creating design fictions around emerging biosensing technologies helped provide us a way to help map out how we define privacy concerns in ways that acknowledge privacy's contingencies and situatedness. From a design perspective, we found that tapping into an author's kind of existing fictional universe as a basis for design helped provide us with a nice concrete starting point. Um, and these imagined worlds that we created were experienced as well as challenged and expanded upon both by us and our participants through the process of creating and viewing the designs. And we think with that we can use these imagined design worlds to interrogate privacy concerns both in current technological trends as well as articulate and consider new imaginaries and think about how privacy might be implicated in future worlds. Uh, so thanks to my collaborators, our participants, and the funding supporters for this work. So thanks, Richmond. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about your motivations for seeing this as a design fiction problem. Like, what is it about design fiction that gives you an importance that other choices could? And yeah. to, to give you a, like a concrete example, yeah. you're using The Circle, right, which is, a, which is a novel. Right. A couple years later, it came out as a movie. But you could have done this with Minority Report, too. Right. right. Which, um, and in that case, you could have also mocked up designs you know, for products like you did in The Circle here. You could have shown people snippets from Philip K. Dick's story. Yeah. You could have shown people clips from Spielberg's movie. So what is it about creating a product for design fiction that gets you that those other two lenses are acting on the Yeah. Um, thanks for that. I think, so design fiction is also, um, I kind of alluded to at the beginning, comes in many forms and often is often in also a textual form or kind of a film video form. Um, Something that I think was useful here was that by making these kind of fictional products and using things like Amazon pages, it kind of taps into people's expectations about what a product is and kind of it makes that blurring between like real and fictional um, slightly more complex, right? If you're watching a science fiction film, you know that it's like a fictional film. Whereas if you're looking at it as an Amazon product, there's kind of that moment of, oh, this, you know, this could be a real thing that exists out there, but is it really or is it not? And having people kind of engage in that questioning about is it real or not led to some interesting reflections about, you know, the privacy implications of them. Um, I'm just curious, how did you elicit the concerns? So did you directly ask people, um, you mean what can go wrong with these technologies, mm -hmm. or you kind of waited until they bring up the issue, and what was your observation on that? How often people would imagine alternative harmful use of those things? Right. Yeah, so um, maybe this also goes to David's question too. Like, so we didn't tell people um, that these were privacy-related designs. We just kind of said, here are some designs we made inspired by some science fiction and inspired by kind of other things that are happening in the world. Um, what do you think about them? And just kind of letting them tell us. And then when they brought up issues around privacy, we kind of probed deeper. But I will say, like, we intentionally made them to try to hit points that we thought people would think about privacy. And it's in this notion of kind of probes where we're intentionally trying to be a little bit provocative and ask people to think about privacy. Right. Yeah, because for us, the research question wasn't necessarily about will they talk about privacy or not, but how are they talking about privacy? And so getting them, sometimes people said like privacy directly, sometimes people brought up kind of side issues that are related to privacy, like data sharing or who owns the data, things like that. Hi, thanks so much for the talk, really enjoyed it. Um, so participants were told that these were design fiction inspired, but I'm wondering if you considered telling participants that these were actually new products coming out on the market, um, and if so, what would you expect their reactions to be? Yeah, um, I, I think it'd be really heterogeneous and would also depend on like what type of audiences that I'm looking at. I think um, if I told them, you know, or imply that they were real things, that some people would be like, oh yeah, that's really cool. I would, you know, love to 
understand more about what my kids are doing all the time. Um, and some people, I think, would be kind of horrified about these things. Um, yeah, there's some work I did where I showed these designs kind of at an open house event and had mixed reactions because it was kind of less clear in that setting whether these were kind of real research products or were they kind of imagined products and had those mixed reactions from people. Um, uh, how do you make design decisions about um, the level of creepiness you incorporate into <laughs> the design? For example, um, the Circles child tracking app, yeah. um, you can design as if it looks super normal, but also you can make it a little bit creepy. Um, how do you go about that? Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I don't think we necessarily um, thought about designing them in terms of like level of creepiness. Um, are, which would be a really interesting way to do it. Um, but we kind of used this framework of privacy as a way to think about kind of how broad we were exploring um, things, right? So for like harm, sometimes we said like in this design, we should have like the government that's violating privacy. In this one, we should have like a friend who's violating someone's privacy and kind of mixing and matching different um, you know, values for these different dimensions was kind of our design process in thinking about different types of privacy concerns. But I like the like more creepy, less creepy too. Yeah. Last question. Uh, thanks, Richmond. Um, so, your focus here is on uh, reported concerns about pr privacy. I'm wondering, from a design perspective, whether or not you gleaned information or or are collecting information about. Um, privacy strategies or how hmm. users might respond to this, this, uh, uh, these designs that you're presenting yeah. to them by changing their behavior? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it came up in different ways. So there was sort of a question in the interviews with people about how would you respond to this technology when they were pointing out problems. Um, some people did kind of think about self-help measures or kind of practices they would engage in, so saying like, oh, I would like smash those cameras as soon as I saw them, or you know, I would like try to avoid certain spaces, um, or like try to fake my data. The other people also pointed to like, maybe it's not me, maybe the government should make a law that prohibits certain types of uses, or maybe you know, we need to train these people who are using them and you need to have a certificate before you can use it. So not all the uh, mitigation strategies were self-focused, but some of them were. Thank you.